Hi, welcome to Become a Curator of Content, Social Bookmarking in the Classroom, presented by me, Tara Graves, for the Washoe County School District 21st Century Learning Division. The objectives for the webinar are as follows. Understand the concept of content curation. Understand how social bookmarking works. Identify ways to use social bookmarking in the classroom. Briefly explore two social bookmarking tools, Digo and Pinterest, and motivate you to explore social bookmarking more in depth. Our guiding framework is what we call the six dimensions of 21st century learning environments, and this comes from the Microsoft Innovative Teaching and Learning Research. This is a one-page guide that we use when we work with teachers on planning their learning activities. The six dimensions are collaboration, knowledge construction, real-world problem solving and innovation, use of technology for learning, self-regulation, and skilled communication. As we go through the webinar, I will highlight uh, some of these dimensions which really are supported by the use of social bookmarking. When the video stops, you'll be directed to a link where you can download this one-page guide um, and view it more closely. So what is a curator? Uh, we usually associate this term with libraries or museums, um, art galleries, but basically it's someone who collects things that are of quality and arranges them in one place in an organized manner. And so when we think about social bookmarking, this really makes teachers curators of content, of information, of resources that we find online. So what is a curator of content? I really like this graphic here uh, that was on social media today. Um, you see the link there. You can go and read the article. But there's, there's some four good qualities that a good content curator should have. The raised eyebrow is basically that you are not um, sharing or or curating articles that are sloppy or inaccurate or unprofessional. Um, you are critical. You are discerning. You are carefully selecting items um, and resources to share that you know are quality. And it does take some time to um, figure out which blogs and which websites and which people to, to follow in order to find uh, good quality information. When you think about it, if you collect, if you're just out there to collect as many um, websites as you possibly can, uh, you're really not giving people um, trust in your credibility or in your um, understanding of quality. So you really want to make sure you're taking the time to select quality resources. The scanning eyes means that you develop a good um, means of skimming and scanning um, different websites and articles that you want to share with your students. You're not, uh, you're not spending hours and hours actually reading in depth, but you are also not just seeing the title and saying, oh, that's good, and, and bookmarking it. So there's kind of a happy medium. You scan it enough to, to realize that it's good information, and you're, but you're not taking hours and hours to go through. Uh, long arms for a big reach. That means you are not just looking at uh, one website that is already been, has already been curated by somebody else, and you're just kind of forwarding that on. But you are you're going to original sources or um, a, a variety of different perspectives. Uh, this really makes 
um, a good content curator. And then the last one that's always hungry to learn, basically you spend a lot of time online and you do enough research for specific topics or issues that you want to share with your students. And you're not, you're not always um, relying on things that are even three or four years old. Um, we know that with the, the world of technology and, and the internet, there are just hundreds and thousands of new bits of information every day. So keeping that content fresh and always looking for new and updated materials is, is really a good quality. This is an interesting graphic as well. Um, if you look across the top, it says uh, the act of finding, grouping, organizing, or sharing the best and most relevant content on a specific issue. And it kind of takes you through a process here. And the first part is aggregation, where you're just finding the information and pulling it together and putting it in a single location. And social bookmarking really uh, makes this easy for us to do. Then you're distilling that information, creating a more simplistic format, and putting only the most important and relevant ideas um, to share with others. Elevation is where we get to um, analyze and synthesize all of the information we're finding and finding trends and insight from that information. The mashup is where our students need a lot of our help because they think uh, there's, there's some confusion with um, what they can do with the information they find online. It's very easy to copy and paste anything that you find online into a Word document and you know put it, put it together in a way that you think it's, it's a new creation. So this is where um, copyright and fair use comes into play when they're putting um, media that they're finding online into a new uh, product or creation. So thinking in terms of images or music or text, uh, they really need to understand the, uh, the implications for using other people's work. So the mashup is definitely a, a very important part of content create, uh, curation. And then our last piece on this is chronology. So organizing it um, chronologically or by time to show how a certain issue or topic or concept or, um, or theory has evolved over time and that's where the internet can really um, be helpful in in finding all of the the history of an event so what is social bookmarking um, when the video stops you'll be directed to this short uh, three-minute video by Common Craft and they explain social bookmarking in plain English. So go ahead and view the video and then come back to the webinar. Okay, so hopefully that gave you just a little brief introduction to um, social bookmarking. And let's go on to um, our next slide here and take a look at this graphic. Social bookmarking allows us to communicate through sharing resources, notes, summaries, and highlights, and to collaborate. And we have this, this term, folksonomy, um, which is derived from the practice and method of collaboratively creating and translating tags to annotate and categorize content. It's also known as collaborative tagging, social classification, social indexing, and social tagging. So if you, it's kind of that mashup word of folk and taxonomy. So folk meaning people, and taxonomy is like an indexing or a categorizing. 
And uh, then we get to that connection piece of it, where we're able, because it's online, we're able to share um, these tags and these resources and this the organization of the resources uh, worldwide, anywhere anyone has access to the internet. And going back to that critical thinking, when you're bookmarking a site, you have to think about um, where does it fit? What are the tags that I'm going to put on this website so that it is properly uh, categorized for anyone who's on my site or on my social bookmarking site? So that brings us to tags. They're it. Um, without the tags, you're basically just collecting websites and putting it in a big mishmash. And that's not useful to anybody, and especially your own your own self. So if you think about um, before social bookmarking came about, and as you were uh, bookmarking sites just for yourself, uh, hopefully you put them into some kind of a folder system so that you could easily find uh, certain websites. If you had Shakespeare sites that you wanted to look at, hopefully you created um, a folder that said Shakespeare. But now with social bookmarking, if you can put as many different tags on there as you think are appropriate so that when someone is searching for specific resources, they can filter it by uh, those tags or keywords. You may have seen this on a blog or a website that you visited. And this is what's called a tag cloud. Now, not all sites will um, will have these linked to um, specific articles, but if you look at it, these are not just topics. A lot of these are just the words that are found. Uh, if you've ever used something like Wordle, uh, where it shows the words that are used the most in a piece of text, and the, the words that are used the most are larger than the other words. Uh, that's what this is, but this does help uh, filter out some of the things that you can find. So why social bookmarking? Uh, this is a, an interesting graphic here. Uh, these are just some of the ways um, that social bookmarking is a great tool uh, not only for teachers, but for students. Why? Number one, the internet is huge. And if we spend, uh, if we expect our students to find quality information online without any guidance, um, it's not going to happen. So we need to um, take the lead in finding good quality information for whatever it is they're doing um, and at least get them started. Uh, you don't you don't want to give them uh, you know okay look on the these two websites here and then write a report. You want to give them a, a good critical mass of sites that you have already gone through and know that they're quality but it, still allowing them um, the freedom to to read and research and then find the the good information from those sites. So social bookmarking allows us to um, narrow it down a bit. So we're not totally trying to drink from the fire hydrant. We're we're making it so it's more manageable, more like a a drinking fountain. So here's some some reasons. Many teachers uh, do not have devices for every student in their classroom. And when they do get to go to the computer lab, time is very limited. So using social bookmarking allows teachers to really um, maximize the amount of time that students have when they can get online and look at resources. Uh, because you as the the teacher has gone through and curated all those great websites and resources um, you can control the quality 
students can spend hours and hours of time just searching for something and you know before you know it an hour has passed and they haven't even found you know one good thing uh, social bookmarking allows you to also create collaborative resources uh, the tools that we'll look at during this webinar are excellent for collaboration um, having one link so one link to your pit Pinterest board or one link to your Digo library or list um, gives them access to many resources. So having a, a web uh, one website for them to go to and they have it bookmarked on their own devices, on their phones, at home, um, allows them to always have access to it and you can continue to add links without ever changing that one initial link that you give them. So it's dynamic and it keeps going as long as they have access. One of the things that social bookmarking allows you to do is really accelerate um, their knowledge acquisition. So if you think about one of the six dimensions is knowledge construction thinking about how much time is spent um, in that you know real unstructured type of search so if you tell kids oh let's we're going to the computer lab and I want you to research the Civil War if they just type in Civil War in a Google search they're going to get millions of hits millions of resources if you have found let's say 20 or 30 even really quality and diverse um, websites and links for them to look at uh, you've already saved them hours and hours of time so now they can put most of the time into to learning and constructing knowledge um, portability and flexibility that means it's it's everywhere they are that they can connect um, it's always with them. If they create a bookmark on their device, um, they can always look at the information that you have found flexible because you can always add more, um, change, change it, take out links that are bad, and so on. Uh, easy and fast searching, easily organized. Um, they can actually, the social part of this then is not only collaborating but also interacting with the resources uh, within the tool itself and when we get to um, the two tools I'll show you what that looks like and then sharing your access so always sharing um, with other teachers with your students with their the parents okay so our two tools here uh, when the video stops, um, you're going to be directed to one link for Digo and one link for Pinterest. And it'll give you a really short glimpse into each of those tools. When, the vid when you're done watching those videos, come back to the webinar and we'll continue. Okay, welcome back. So let's take a look at Digo. And DIGO is actually an acronym. Uh, stands for Digest of Internet Information Groups and Other Stuff. Um, so you saw some of the basic features where you can um, highlight and you can put sticky notes on there and you can also have groups. So I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, one of my DIGO um, libraries. Okay, and I'll just show you around. This is how it looks. Uh, you can create these are different lists so I've created different lists um, based on uh, 21st century skills okay and so basically it just looks like a, a list of resources or a list of links um, and these are some tags see here and I can also add more of a description here I can add it to another list 
and I can share it to a group. So thinking in terms of your own classroom, um, starting with different groups. So maybe you teach biology and you have um, uh, you, you can create a biology group and then in your lists you can create all the different topics that you cover in biology. So think in terms of those kinds of hierarchies. So that's one way. Uh, going on to, let's go on to a site and there are tools in Digo that you use um, and there's a couple things. The reason why I'm showing all of my browser is to show you these tools. So one of the tools is called a Digolet. And this is the, um, the sweet part of any social bookmarking is they have a button that you add to your browser to allow you to quickly add websites and manipulate them. So this is the Digolet and I'm going to use a highlighter so I can pick a color okay so let's just take yellow so I'm going to highlight see there so I highlighted that and let's add a sticky note too. So let's put the sticky note. All right, so you can put, you can assign it to a different group. Okay, and then I can click post. And I can move it right here where I want someone to see. Now anybody that's in this group that I've assigned it to, so this is the group right here, this Wicked Cool Tools, anybody that's in my group that comes to this website can see where I've highlighted and see my little sticky note. And they can add, let me get it to open again, they can add uh, more information right here beneath it. Okay, so that's one of the really cool things. You can also click on the, sh the read later. So it puts it into a read later folder. Um, and this is where I can go back out to the main Digo site. Or I can just bookmark it. So this is where I can, uh, if it wasn't already bookmarked, um, I create the bookmark, I put the description in, I put my tags in, and I can add it to any of my lists or groups, and then save. Uh, because I'm using Chrome, uh, they do have a little tool extension here um, where I can also take a screenshot. I can also share this page. And let's see. That's not popping up. So, and I can also annotate. So, if there's somewhere I want to, uh, I can write more here. So, it's pretty much the same thing as the Deagolette, but if you use Chrome, it just makes it a little easier to look at. And then I can take a look at all the annotations that everyone has left. Okay, so that's that's basics of Digo. What I like about Digo as well is um, here's the list of their tools. That's where you get the Digolet, the the book uh, little browser helper. If you have uh, use a favorite browser, you can add all these different um, extensions. Okay, so there are the tools. They also have a great help site and basically helps you get started. Their videos and tutorials. 
Now, Deco hasn't um, updated much recently, um, but still really um, great resources there, so don't get put off by the, the older versions of things. Um, it is pretty easy to use. Okay, so that's Digo. Now, this one's my favorite, and I have to warn you that if if you are not a current Pinterest user, uh, you probably will be after this. And I do apologize for creating uh, an, a a habit that you might be. Uh, getting mad about because it will take a lot of your time. Pinterest is amazing and it it's it's used by a lot of teachers um, and a lot of just a lot of people in general use Pinterest for planning a wedding or a baby shower or recipes. Um, it's just a really fun tool uh, but also very um, very creative and interesting for teachers. So Pinterest, um, if you look at pin and interest, so thinking about like a bulletin board, this is the concept of Pinterest. And maybe, you know, back in the day you would cut out magazine pictures and put them up on a bulletin board because those were your favorite things, um, ideas, you know, decorating ideas or classroom ideas and, and just little clippings of things that you wanted to keep. So that's the concept, is you are pinning things to boards. And the images actually represent links to websites. Um, and boards versus pins. So the board itself, and we'll, and we'll go take a look at it, is like the category or the topic. And then the pins are all of the ideas that you're putting on that board. Um, it is also collaborative. Um, more than one person can pin to a board. And I wanted to also share with you these this really cool infographic on how educators are using Pinterest. So again, curating content, organizing ideas, collaborating with others, and then having students use it. So thinking about, let me just go to um, our Pinterest site. Thinking about having one place, again, one link, this is our Pinterest site up here, where you've got many boards to share different resources with students. I'm going to go ahead and click on the social bookmarking board. If I can find it here. Here it is. To show you uh, resources. So you can pin an image, a video, you can now PDF or uh, pin a PDF, which you weren't able to do. They just recently changed that. Here's one that's a PDF. So how Pinterest works is you click on the image, and that makes it larger. Then you click on it again, and it actually takes you to the website or the resource. So this is a PDF. of one of the resources I've pinned. And the social aspect of it as well is people can comment. People can do several things with resources. They can pin it themselves to their their own Pinterest board. They can like it. They could visit the site. They could send it to someone else. They can share it on Facebook. Um, and they can also, like I said, they can write some comments. So using this with students, you can have a set of resources 
that you would say tonight's homework is to go on this Pinterest board and look at five different resources and then put comments below it so then you'll see all of the comments that students have left. So I do want to show you some uh, different boards. This is just a search I did on, um, on Pinterest in their search and I just searched for algebra and just looked for pins. You can search pins or boards. Okay, so all of these boards were created by people that, and they named it algebra or pinners would probably not turn up too many because the pinners name would have to be algebra or interest. So let's just go back to the pins. And you can look through say, oh, this is neat. Here's a little um, flip book that someone made. And if I click through, it takes me to, this is actually to a product that someone's created on Teachers Pay Teachers. So I could purchase that if I wanted to. Or I can go back and say, oh, this is interesting. And again, you click on it twice to get to the original source. And there's like there's I can download it right from here. And I can go back. So it's just interesting. You just go through and look and find you can find resources, blog posts. Uh, printables, sometimes you can find videos. So let me go back, let's take a look at some other ideas, other searches. So here's the Civil War. Now again, you can find boards that other people have already curated and put together and you can link that out for students or you can create your own. But you do want to have a purpose. You don't want to just tell students, oh, go to this link and, um, you know, just check it out. You want to give them um, a purpose for their search. So if, you, if your homework assignment is go to this Pinterest board and you can actually, when you pin it, when you create your own boards. You can put anything here. Uh, let me show you. So let's say I'm going to pin this. I can put this on whatever board I want and I can change what this says. That only happens when you pin something. You can't change what someone else has put um, unless you pin it. So you could create a board and you can put whatever you want in the description. So you can say, um, for this resource, I want you to um, watch the video, and then I want you to, in the comments to um, write, you know, your thoughts, or you could have a question, or whatever it is. Uh, you can personalize it to your own um, needs. Okay, and then so here's some for primary students, reading skills, reading tools. So just really is a nice way for you to connect with other teachers and just get some fresh ideas. And you can also create pins yourself. So if you have some great ideas, you can take pictures of, you know, posters in your room and put it up on Pinterest. You can, you can um, when you're finding resources online, you can just pin it and uh, write in the description your ideas for using it. Uh, some people like, here's another idea, something, some interesting uses of Pinterest. One 
uh, which I found for just finding scholarships. So those students in high school looking for scholarships. Um, another really clever use is the Amber Alert. Now this, I know this has nothing to do with um, the classroom, but how clever to use social media in this way where you can reach hundreds and thousands of people on one uh, medium and it can be spread like wildfire. So people that follow my, my pin boards um, can pin it and then all those people that follow their pin board see it and pin it. Uh, just a crazy, crazy way to get information um, passed quickly around the world. So I also want to show you, let me go back, let me go to this website here. Um, Let's say I wanted to pin this. Um, I would just, I want to show you this little, here's the pin it button. And this is just like how the Digo button was, or the Digolette over here. Um, but if I just click on pin it, it pops up with the images. So it finds all the images that are on that site that I could pin. And because this one's the most appropriate, because it's showing uh, this actual resource, I can click pin it and then I can decide you know where I want it to go and then I can type in um, I can type in whatever I wanted to say and then I can click pin it then it also pops up with uh, who else has pinned this and it'll it'll pop up and then if you like you know what this person has pinned you can also follow their board and that's the social aspect of it let me go back to Pinterest itself and I'll click on um, my our profile here so I can look at your profile and pin so you can look at all your boards if you want to just look at it in terms of pins which sometimes it's fun to do it mixes them all up so it doesn't show you um, just the ones that are on that board but it does organize it by the most recent ones okay you can also search let me go over here you can find friends you can follow boards you can change the settings Okay, so you, it uses Facebook, and if you already have a Facebook account, you can you you can log in, um, you can create your Pinterest account, uh, and I also think you can do it through Twitter as well. And boards are interesting. It already comes. Let me go ahead and close this. It already comes with. Um, I, mean, I just clicked on this upper left hand corner all of these different boards that um, or categories I should say and let's say education and it's also got it categorized uh, by different topics so let's say hmm let's pick technology So I can go through, and it, it goes even further down. Let's go to social media. And here are things that people have pinned, and this is just a worldwide, whoever's on Pinterest. And let's say I like this one on blogging. So I'm going to go ahead and pin it. And I'm going to put it on my blogs board. And then it's also showing me that someone put it on their infographics board. So I'm going to go ahead and follow them. And then when I go to Pinterest, it will show. So if I go to my profile and pins, I can see 
um, who's following me and who I'm following. And I can click on who I'm following and the pinners themselves and it shows me who I'm following and I can click here and then I can click on boards so it says the name of the board and then the person and if you decide that you don't like what someone is pinning you can unfollow them as well And liking is just a way to let someone know that you liked something that they pinned, but you're not actually saving that onto your own boards. Okay, this next slide is an interesting graphic here, but it, it's also actually showing you how to use Pinterest to move up Bloom's taxonomy. So if you look at the bottom, um, the things you're doing on Pinterest that relate to just remembering. So labeling, listing, defining vocabulary on a board, moving all the way up to create. So build a resource board for a unit as a class with a community board or plan an event by collecting ideas and organizing tasks on a board, um, inventing a new feature for Pinterest, uh, curating a news board with pins to credible news articles. So if you're a social studies teacher and you're studying um, current events, you could have students collaborate on a board as they're finding resources um, online. Uh, these are, uh, this is a free account, so you would go to um, Pinterest.com and just have uh, students create a new account. Many of them already have Facebook, uh, but again, make sure that uh, you are aware of all the uh, privacy laws that are that might be impacted. And funny enough that I found this on Pinterest as well. And it's finally coming true because you're here watching this webinar for professional development and getting to use Pinterest. So think back to the six dimensions that we talked about at the beginning. And there are three that I have highlighted that really fit with using social bookmarking. So when the video stops, you'll be directed to back to our six dimensions and I'd like you to identify the three that are described here Did you get them? So we did talk about knowledge construction and using social bookmarking to curate quality resources for students rather than having them uh, searching aimlessly on Google for hours um, allows more time to be spent on constructing knowledge. So interpreting, analyzing, synthesizing and evaluating that information. They're not spending hours looking for the information. The information is found for them and they can spend more time thinking and putting it together and seeing the the trends and the insights and how does one resource um, compare to another. And the learning goals being interdisciplinary um, media, multimedia allows us to do this, so we're using resources on the web. Uh, we can 
find resources that allow them to look at different perspectives, whether it's math or science, um, reading and writing and listening and speaking. It, it gets all of those different disciplines um, involved when they're able to look at a variety of resources online. They're collaborating. If you have students uh, working together on um, creating a board or creating a list uh, within, within Digo, they are working together to build that information. Uh, they can also use it to, um, when they are looking at the things that you've pinned, um, they are uh, collaborating on their learning from each of those resources. Uh, you're also bringing in some of uh, skill communication in there as well. Uh, use of technology for learning. Again, so many of these things that you can find and curate um, would not be possible without technology. And for them to create knowledge and construct knowledge, they are needing to use this technology. And the designers of a technology product, if they are creating um, their own board or they are creating their own Digo list, um, and doing the highlighting and things like that. Uh, they are in some ways, it's kind of a stretch for that, but they're in some ways creating a technology product out of um, these tools. Uh, more ideas are on the Pinterest board. So we've already taken a look at that briefly. So there's some other links here to articles and ideas for using uh, social bookmarking in general and also Digo and Pinterest specifically. And I, I touched briefly on this, um, but really when we're using tools online and anywhere where students have to create an account, um, you need to think about student privacy and online safety, um, protecting their data, and so on. Uh, you need to be familiar with these laws. There's a link there at the bottom to our Pinterest board on accept acceptable use policies and privacy concerns. Also make sure, sure you are talking to your administrator and getting parent permission for any of these tools that you are using in the classroom. Uh, if, you are, if you do not want students to um, create accounts, they can still access your lists or your boards. They just won't be able to comment or to um, interact with the resources. So they won't be able to highlight and they won't be able to put sticky notes in Digo um, or they won't be able to um, repin things from Pinterest, but they can view all of the resources without creating accounts. Um, I know in Digo there are um, you can create a you could have a teacher account and create a group for each of your classes so that students don't have to have email; they can still be part of the group. Pinterest at this time does not have that option for teachers. So um, I would make sure you uh, read the, the um, terms of service and make sure that they are in compliance with um, student privacy. And if you want to learn more about being a 21st century educator, please visit our website at wcsd21.com. Follow us on Twitter at WCSD21, and you've seen our Pinterest site, so make sure if you are interested in using Pinterest that you are following us so you can always stay uh, current with the things that we are sharing. I thank you very much uh, for participating in this webinar, and please follow me on Twitter at NVTerraGraves. Have a good evening.